Well, that is all to say Jack Parsons was in a weird, vulnerable, transitory place in 1945. And it was during this emotional state that Parsons began practicing magic with one of the worst people Woo. in history to be around Here we come. if you're feeling vulnerable. We, we gotta have some kind of intro music. <laughs> we have to have that like what they used to do for, uh, oh, for yeah. Don Rickles. <laughs> oh, yeah. we get the gong from The Undertaker. Yeah. <laughs> that person was L. Ron Hubbard, founder of the Church of Scientology. Now, if you remember from our L. Ron Hubbard series, we did cover this relationship from his kind of perspective, mm -hmm. which was that Jack Parsons was another speed bump on his way to true herodom and godlike status, right? That Jack Parsons was just a dude he sucked up and spit out. Yeah. Right. But now we're seeing how Jack was affected and what it's like when you meet a young, you know, imagine what it was like when you when you met me for the first time. I oh. remember that. You yeah. meet this dynamic kind yeah. of like, who's that sex? He's obviously full of sex. All he does is fucking write and think yeah. and amaze. Uh -huh. He's a story spinner. Everybody's <laughs> jealous of his style. Right. Yeah, sure, he was a fucking war hero in name only, but guess what? That's the best way to be because then you don't have all those sad, real stories mm -hmm. after the fact you of all the, all, the ba all the baggage. Yeah. yeah, like you made up all the sketches and stuff like that. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Now, in 1945, L. Ron Hubbard was just another science fiction writer spending time in Los Angeles. He was mostly living off the disability he'd scammed from the government following his ignoble career in the Navy. So baby! Yeah. <laughs> but L. Ron was actually doing fairly well in the sci-fi game because he'd moved on from westerns with oddly homoerotic names like uh, Ride 'em Cowboy. Sure, yeah. that's just uh, what they do. I yeah. remember that. Uh, Buckskin B Brigade. I that's just, remember that. That's just a group of leather-clad boys that uh -huh. are hard dusted from the road, and yeah, they're a bit thirsty for each sure, other. But when yeah. it comes down to it, it's hard when you only have horses for company. Well, mm -hmm. do you want your garage built or not? You gotta call them. And do you remember? Hot lead payoff. Mm. <laughs> I actually don't remember that one. I remember That's warm good. goo payoff. <laughs> yeah. Well, Elron was a member of the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society, which was a group of sci-fi writers who regularly gathered for meetings at the cafeteria we mentioned last episode. Mm. And these meetings were also regularly attended by Jack Parsons. See, Parsons was certainly a big sci-fi fan, and he was what you'd call a good hang to Every, boot. Everybody said vibes were immaculate. Mm, when you hung sure. out with Jack Parsons, you were going to have a good time because he wasn't a bummer to be around. He was a fun guy. Mm -hmm. He was he was like that. He was, a, and it just so happened to be hot people kind of attacked themselves to him. Ooh, yeah. it's like us. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of cool. Well, well, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's fun that you're putting L. Ron Hubbard in the hot people category. Well, hey, according man. to Henry, is you can just see the cooks before these nerds come in be like, did you make the extra jello or not? Because if they don't get their jello, they only, they only eat food they can manipulate. <laughs> And Jack, he loved I need a food that's between states. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Robert Heinlein. And he's honestly a difficult man. Yeah. Robert Heinlein was a very yeah. good man. They're all difficult men. Yes. Yeah. Is Isaac Asimov like a good hang? No. I don't think so. He was so. a miserable fuck. He just seemed like he was really thinking about the future when sometimes you need to think about the present. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Well, Jack loved attending these meetings because the writers took Jack seriously, and Jack was loved in turn because he was one of the few scientists who saw sci-fi as a source of inspiration. All the rest of them looked at it as kid stuff. Yeah. Now, as far as Jack Parsons and Al Ron Hubbard went, it's hard to say who was attracted to who first, mm. or if Hubbard immediately saw Parsons as a mark who could be sucked dry of all his knowledge mm. and money. I Well, I'll posit a little bit of Occam's razor here. Mm. I think that he needed a place to stay, <laughs> and that he was running scams all over town and with the government, and then he got an opportunity to stay at mm. Jack Parsons' house, and I do think that, again... Jack Parsons saw him and was like, this guy's funny. I do think there's a little bit of that. And everybody else, we waver. We yeah. waver between Elron, right? Is he full of shit? Do we? Well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're the only oscillating fan. Of this <laughs> <laughs> because I appreciate his tactics. I yeah. appreciate his energy. His style. Like he's <laughs> the boat. Of, I'm on the boat. Cause a lot of harm in some ways. <laughs> Nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> because David Miskovich actually did it poorly. But we'll get into that when we do the David Miskovich episodes later on. Yes, That's absolutely. Right. Um, but I feel like there's a little bit of... The thing about magicians, especially Jack Parsons' ilk, I think that you can see that this guy's full of shit, but you could also be like, this guy's hilarious. And well, that there's a little bit of that. We're like, this is a fun guy to have in the room. Yeah. yeah. Well, what they said about L. Ron Hubbard at the time is that when you met him, you were either immediately repulsed 
Sure. Or which was a word they used a lot I could see in that. relation to L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Some people don't like peanut butter. I'm looking at you, UK. <laughs> Absolutely. They do like peanut butter in the UK. Yeah, they learned. Yeah. They, we forced it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were either repulsed or you quickly fell under his charm. And Parsons, of course, was charmed, saying that he recognized Hubbard immediately as a man possessing great magical skill, which okay. is a statement I wholeheartedly agree with. Sure. Oh, yeah. He was a very charming man. I mean, again, you're amongst it. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not talking See, about the charming. He's, I don't think he was a charming man, but he was a fantastic. He did have a fantastic magical mind. Oh, yes. Because, again, anybody who can make up your entire past, which is what the, <laughs> every single one of the great magicians <laughs> of all history have ever done, which is you get rid of all that boring shit. The whole I know. You get rid of all that right. shit mm-hmm. and you pave it all over with what your version of history is. And yes, some people call it lying. Yeah. But some people also call it world building. Okay. <laughs> In addition, Al Ron Hubbard was the only sci fi writer at these meetings who had also studied the works of Aleister Crowley. And he already had a deep understanding of the material in the same way Parsons did. Basically, it's like finding someone who likes your favorite band just as much as you do, and for all the same reasons. Oh my God, you like the Glorp Brothers too? I can't <laughs> believe it. They're so incredible. Their song, Going Glorpin. Oh, I forgot <laughs> all the time. Off the album, Going Glorp. I know. <laughs> The difference, though, was that while Parsons was a true believer who just wanted to make something happen, Hubbard was more cynical and looked at magic as just another resource to extract and use no matter the consequence. Put another way, Parsons used magic like you might use solar power. Hmm. L. Ron Hubbard used it more like fracking. It's because gas is clean. <laughs> LRH. I mean, it is kind of fun being like, what police department's going to sink next? Do you think it'll be like a, will an ele- elementary school go back to the... Uh, we find out. That's what's kind of fun about fracking. Yeah, it is. You <laughs> never know when sink, something's right? going to be a sinkhole. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's, uh, I feel like it was a gradual process in a way. We'll go, as we go through their relationship, mm-hmm. I think that uh, on LRH's uh, behalf, because he was already cooking up Excalibur. You remember he had all his, sec- the book that would kill you? Yeah. Like the book that he would say like, oh, you can't see my secret manuscript. So he was already kind of like in that world and mm-hmm. wanting to be in that world. And it wasn't until like he saw the actual paperwork of the OTO yeah. where he was just like there's my shit like yeah. ah yeah it's like he finally kind of saw like little pieces at this time had he already done the affirmations no the affirmations well I want to get to that because it's <laughs> after all of this okay I'm just happy that L. Ron Hubbard didn't do what People Magazine did when they were like the man of the year or person of the year and it was just a fake mirror because we were I all hate, the person of the I year makes me because I can totally angry. see him thinking like what if the end it's not Xenu it's you but that's <laughs> Kissel yeah. You fucking asshole correct. <laughs> nice. You can stumbled into magical knowledge, yeah, which it. is the whole thing. That's the nth level. Like, we'll yeah. again, I want to talk about it more, but like Crowley kind of like hints at this whole thing at the very, ah, I'm going to yeah. wait. I'm going to wait. Yeah. Wow. You basically just said you are your own God. Yeah. But that's the thing is that it takes you a long time to understand what it means to be your own God. You it takes a lot of earn- money that you have to give to L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> but no, this is the difference between Scientology and ritual magic, where Scientology is a never ending source of psychological and spiritual DLCs where <laughs> the fucking magic like all the magic world it's supposed to release you up and out yeah. like it is you're supposed to end it knowing at the very end and we'll get it well I, <laughs> ah, ah! all right your brain's about to explode now when Hubbard moved into the Parsons mansion in 1945 he was only three years older than Jack hmm. and true to form everyone in the house was either repulsed or charmed by good old Ron <laughs> Parsons, of course. <laughs> he just looks like you. <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing you share in common. I'm just so happy you don't look like Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible haircut. Yes. That's my main gripe. Truly. Parsons, of course, wanted everyone to like Hubbard. And he even wrote gushing letters of praise about his new friend. Here's an excerpt from one of those letters. He is a gentleman. Red hair, green eyes. Honest and intelligent, and we have become great friends. Although he has no formal training in magic, he has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. He is the most thelemic person I have ever met, and 
I have eaten my own cum. Wow. <laughs> and is in complete accord with our own principles. All right. Well, there you go. He's thalemic. Don't cut him. He'll bleed forever. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Funny go. stuff, Gissel. Now, what does he mean by he's the most thalemic person he's ever met? All right. Well, we can let's unpack it for a little bit because I, on some level, uh, I love our thalemites. All right, no, no judgment, right? Love our thelemites. Sure. Um, uh, you guys are you guys are an intense bunch, right? Yeah. And it's very difficult to get together in a group because each one of you is a star, and I think that's great. But it also tends you guys all fight literally constantly about what everything means, which is an important aspect of Crowley's work. Sure. Right? You're supposed to adjudicate it, right? But when he means by thelemic, I think is that when he met this dude straight up. One of the great barriers to magical ritual, like, and this is just the truth, is that you have to be able to have a certain amount of patience with looking like a moron yeah. while doing it. You got to put a hat on. You got to wear a robe. You got to do the, like, Io, son of Gabriel. You got to do these, like, <laughs> hand motions. You got to do all of this shit. And that's actually pretty much the major barrier to entry at the very, very top. That's how you know whether or not you're a quote-unquote neophyte or not, is if you are naturally inclined to be into the material. 